Hello students, this is Dr. Fenton. In this video, we're going to cover Chapter 3, which discusses adjusting entries. Now, adjusting entries are made by companies at the end of the accounting period to bring the accounts up to date so that we can prepare accurate financial statements. Now, this uh, video is, is very long. Uh, it has a lot of detailed work in it. So, you know, pay close attention to what I talk about. I'm going to go through the chapter again, step by step. But go back and review parts of this video if you need to. So let me go to the other screen and let's get started. Okay, chapter three, the accounting cycle, end of the period. Next section, the measurement process. Here's what we're doing in this chapter. Um, now we're gonna talk about adjusting entries and then we're going to prepare financial statements. What this illustration is showing you is a timeline, and this is one for the entire year. It goes from January 1st to the end of the end of the year, December 31st. And we can do this for a quarter of the year, which is three months, or one month. And this one month period is what most of our examples coming up uh, that are really from chapter two talk about. So it can be, again, an accounting period, a year, a quarter, or a month. During the regular accounting period, we do record the external transactions. We saw that back, at, back in chapter two. In this chapter, again, we will concentrate on end of the period, end of the year, adjusting entries, and prepare financial statements. So closing entries, we'll talk about just a little bit, um, but, uh, but not a whole lot. Not only in this chapter, but for the rest of the course, we are going to be using something called the accrual basis accounting. So what is this? They have two parts to the definition. The first one, we record revenues in the period that goods and services are provided to customers. What this means is that we, re we record what is actually happening you know, as to the activity in the accounting period. So when we do the work for a customer, when we make a sale to a customer, we record that as revenue when that happens. As to expenses, number two, we record expenses in the period that costs are used to provide those goods and services to customers. So we'll talk more about this a little bit later. As to revenue recognition, this is a very important principle that you need to know, and it states, revenue is recorded in the period in which goods and services are provided to customers. I just mentioned that. They talk about several examples, you know, FedEx. So when FedEx delivers a package, it earns revenue. When American Eagle sells a shirt, it earns revenue. Now I have Geico uh, highlighted here because be careful about this one. Uh, this maybe could have been a better example. But when Geico provides insurance coverage, Geico will record the revenue. This is not the same thing as like us paying Geico uh, insurance for like six months in advance. And let's say you did that. Let's say you have your insurance through GEICO. You, you pay them six months in advance. When GEICO first receives the cash, it does not record revenue. Of course, it receives, you know, reports the cash coming in. But as we saw in the previous chapter, it would record a liability account called deferred revenue because they owe us six months worth of coverage. As those months expire month by month, that's when GEICO records the revenue. So it does not record revenue when cash comes in the door, but it records revenue as it provides insurance coverage month to month to month. As to expenses, talked about this a few minutes ago, any cost used to help generate revenues, they are recorded as expenses in that same period as those revenues. You know, those revenues they help to generate. So like FedEx, when it delivers a package, it had to pay the driver, you know, the fuel for the truck and so forth. It will record those expenses in that same accounting period when the revenue was generated. Okay. Another example, maybe to help us out, would be an airline. Let's say you buy an airline ticket today and the flight is sometime next year. Well, you pay for it today. The airline would record cash coming in the door today, but also would record deferred revenue, which is a liability account. So it does not report revenue when you buy the ticket. Next year, when you make the flight, that's when the airline would report the revenue. 
Uh, it would decrease the liability account and increase the revenue account. And also next year, it would record expenses for the fuel for the plane, the salaries for the pilots and flight attendants. So they try to match the revenues and expenses in the same year. Next section. Okay, accrual basis compared with cash basis. Now for our purposes, don't worry about the cash basis accounting very much. Uh, you might have one, maybe two multiple choice questions on the exam about cash basis accounting, but nothing more than that. So don't worry about it very much. Now, any medium sized company and larger must use the accrual basis accounting system. And again, that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the chapter and the rest of the course. Small companies can use the cash basis. Okay. Now the cash basis is just what the, the name says. If cash comes in the door, you report revenue you know, from customers, of course. If you pay expenses in cash that period, you record the expense. To sort of help explain this, we have this illustration 3-2. And this relates to transactions we saw back in the previous chapter. If you remember, on December 12th, we provided soccer training to customers, and on that same day, they paid us cash, $4,300. An accrual basis company would report the revenue on that same day because the services were provided that same day. Okay, so it's when the services were provided. Now, if the company was, was using the cash basis, and again, you select one or the other, you don't, you don't use both at the same time. And most companies will be using the accrual basis. But if it was using the cash basis, since cash was collected that same day, cash, you know, the, the uh, revenue would be recorded. Okay? So there's no difference between accrual basis and cash basis in when you record the revenue if you perform the services at the same time you collect the cash. Let's look at a difference. On December 17th, we provided soccer training to customers on account, you know, $2,000. As you remember, what this means is that on December 17th, we provided training but did not collect the cash. These customers are going to pay us sometime in the future. If you remember the entry, the entry was to debit accounts receivable and credit revenue. Okay. Now, that's the accrual basis. You report the revenue. Cash basis in this accounting period would report no revenue. Why? Because you did not collect the cash. You provide the services, but the cash basis says wait until you receive the cash before you report the revenue. And one more quick example here. Uh, on December 23rd, we received payment in advance before we provided the lessons. So someone paid us $600 for some lessons into the future. Under the accrual basis of accounting, we don't report even you know, any revenue. We received the cash, yes, but we have not done the work. We've not provided the services, so don't report the revenue yet. Cash basis, if you're using this, this basis, you would report the revenue because cash came in the door, even though you have not provided the services at this point. So a couple of quick examples. And you can look through this, uh, and you can look, th look at these other examples too about expenses. The main thing here is whenever you, you use the service, or in this case the rent, that's when you report uh, the expense. I'll go ahead and cover December 1st, just as an example, because we're going to see this in an adjusting entry in just a minute. On December 1st, we paid rent one year in advance. I mean, we rarely do this, but that's what they use for the example. So December 1st, you paid $6,000 for an entire year in advance, and that's the rate of $500 per month. Now, if you remember, the entry was to increase or to debit prepaid rent, and then you credited cash because you paid the cash. On December 1st, you don't record the expense because we haven't used up any of the, in the rent yet, the building yet. Uh, we'll record the expense month by month as we use the, the facilities, but you don't record expense until you use the facilities, in other words, until the time period goes by. On that same date, though, if you are a strict cash basis uh, accounting uh, business, you would report the expense because that's when you paid for it. You haven't used it up yet, 
In fact, you haven't used any of it as of December 1st, but since you paid it out, that's when the expense is recorded. So look at these other exa examples also and read through this and they give you another review example down here. Let's go to the next section. Adjusting entries. Adjusting entries are used to bring the accounts up to date at the end of the accounting period so that we can prepare accurate financial statements. As it says here, adjusting entries are used to record changes in assets and liabilities and their related revenues and expenses. Now, one thing to remember is that the cash account is never adjusted with an adjusting entry. So we never touch the cash account. Almost any other asset account we can adjust. Usually we don't adjust like long-term assets like buildings and land and so forth. But one thing is for certain we, certain, we never adjust the cash account. Adjusting entries can be grouped into two broad categories, prepayments and accruals. Now prepayments involve cash flows incurring before the revenues and expenses are recognized. What does this mean? Let's look at this illustration. In prepaid expenses, then whenever we pay cash in advance for something we're going to use up in the future, we create the asset account. Again, the example we've already seen is prepaid rent. So when we pay rent in advance, we credit cash, of course, and then we debit a new account called prepaid rent. That's an asset account. In the current period, at the end of the current period, really, an adjusting entry will be used to decrease the asset account and recognize part of that as an expense. We've already talked about this before. And so what you would do is debit the expense account, the rent expense account, and credit prepaid rent. That would happen in the adjusting entry. So we paid cash in advance. Now we're using up the item that we paid in advance. Supplies is the same way. Deferred revenue. Again, cash happened before we provided the services. So we collected, you know, uh, cash in advance. We are going to provide services in the future. When we received cash, we debited cash. The credit was to deferred revenue, a liability account. The adjusting entry at the end of the period, we will reduce the liability account. So we will debit prepaid, or excuse me, deferred revenue and we will credit the revenue account. So these are examples of the prepayments. The cash happened before the activity. This is an example of an accrual where the event happened before the cash you know, transaction occurred. So in this one, we increase the liability for the amount to be paid and we recognize the expense. We do this at the end of the year with an adjusting entry. An example we'll see in a few minutes will be like um, utilities expense. If we receive the utility bill at the end of the accounting period, and this is for what we've already used up as to utilities, but we haven't paid it yet, we need to record that as an expense that same year. So we're going to debit like utility expense and credit accounts payable. Later on, like it says here in the future period, in the next accounting period, that's when we pay the cash and settle the liability that we set up with the adjusting entry. Accrued revenue. If we provide services to someone and we don't you know, collect the cash at that point, we recognize the revenue, but then recognize also the fact they owe us the money. So if at the end of the year, we have not recorded this event and we provided the services, we need to make this adjusting entry to set up the receivable and also record the revenue and later on we'll receive the cash. So two general types of adjusting entries, prepayments and accruals. Here are the transactions we saw from chapter two. We've already gone through these, what they call external transactions to make the entries for these. And now we're gonna look at some of these and see that we need to make adjusting entries at the end of the accounting period, at the end of December, to make sure the accounts are up to date. So first we'll look for prepaid expenses. The first example is rent. I've already talked about this a couple of times. On December 1st, we paid $6,000 rent in advance 
for an entire year, not just for the rest of this year, not for one month, but for December 1st through the end of November next year. Okay. Now, during December, though, we've used the facility, so we've used up one month of rent. That means at the end of December, we only have 11 months of rent that really are prepaid from this point on. So the ending balance in the prepaid rent account should have only $5,500 in it. We had placed $6,000 in that account at December 1st, so we need to remove $500 from that account, re you know, reduce the asset, and record that as an expense. Here's the entry. Debit rent expense, $500. Credit prepaid rent, $500. Okay. So look at this. We paid rent a year in advance, December 1st. One month has expired. We need to recognize one month as an expense because we've used the facility one month of the 12 that we have paid for. So at the end of the year, let's recognize this expense for one month, 500. Reduce the asset account prepaid rent with the credit, $500. Let's look at supplies. On December 6th, we purchased $2,300 of supplies on account. So if you remember the entry back on December 6th, we debited supplies, that's an asset account, we credited accounts payable. Now, again, don't worry about the cash flow here, we will eventually pay the accounts payable, but the key here is how do we handle the cost of the supplies? When we first buy them, we have not used any supplies, so they are all assets. Assets are, you know, resources we can use in the future. That was December 6th. Get to the end of that month, the end of the year, the accounting period, we found out that we had $1,300 of supplies remaining. In other words, we have not used up $1,300 of supplies. Well, we purchased $2,300. We have not used $1,300. That means we have used, during the month of December, $1,000 of supplies. So the supplies that we've used, we need to write off as an expense. The adjusting entry on December 31st, to recognize that fact, is debit supplies expense, $1,000, and credit supplies, $1,000. Supplies is the asset account, so we're going to reduce it and record the portion we've used as an expense. Depreciable assets. This is um, uh, a topic we're going to cover in more depth in a later chapter, and we're just going to touch on it here. But remember, we paid $24,000 for equipment on December 1st. Now, equipment we're going to be able to use for several years. In fact, they tell us in the reading up here that the company estimates the equipment will be used for the next five years, and that's 60 months. Okay, So we buy it today. But we can use it for the next 60 months or five years. When we first buy it, we record an asset account, you know, equipment, $24,000. We also credit the cash account, $24,000. So you increase one asset, equipment, decrease another asset, cash, for $24,000. Now here we are at the end of the month, and we need to record the fact we've used part of this asset, it had a life of 60 months. One month has gone by, so we've used the equipment for one month now. We need to record the fact that we have an expense. We've used the equipment for one month. So the, the way we get the $400 they show us up here is take the $24,000 cost of the equipment times 1 over 60, 60 months. So make sure you put 1 over 60 in this case and not 1 over 5 because we haven't gone an entire year since we purchased the asset. We've gone one month. So this gets you the accurate number, one month of depreciation. The cost times one month over 60 months, $400. The adjusting entry then is to record depreciation expense, $400, and a new account called accumulated depreciation. Now this accumulated depreciation account is what's called a contra asset account. It belongs with the assets but it increases with a credit balance. We'll talk more about that, you know, 
a little bit later on in this chapter, but a lot in a, pre, in a future chapter. So there's the entry for depreciation. Debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. Don't credit the equipment account. We have a special account used to record the depreciation as we take it with every adjusting entry. And they give an example for Federal Express, uh, just to look at accumulated depreciation. They list their long-term assets, the total, and then they take away accumulated depreciation. So the net property and equipment in their balance sheet as assets will be 25981 So you subtract out accumulated depreciation. Now deferred revenues. On December 30, 23rd, the uh, customers, you know, some customers paid us $600 in advance before we provided the services. That was December 23rd. Now, by the time we get to the end of the year, we have provided some of those services. In fact, they tell us that we have provided four lessons of the 12 that were paid for. We provided four already by the end of the year. And so at 50 per lesson and four lessons, that's $200 we have earned. We collected all the cash December 23rd, but now we've earned part of it. So we need to show the portion we've earned as revenue. The entry, reduce, in other words, debit deferred revenue, this liability, for $200, and record service revenue, $200. Now the reason we reduce this liability is because we don't owe them this $200 worth of lessons anymore. Now, when they first paid us, yes, we owe them $600 worth of lessons. Well, seven days later, we have earned $200 of those lessons. And so we, re we record this as reduce debit deferred revenue, increase service revenue. This is the portion we've earned as of the end of the year. Also at the end of the year, the balance that stays into the deferred revenue account is $400. That means going into next year, we owe these customers another $400 worth of lessons. Lowe's has deferred revenue on its accounts, where customers paid in advance, maybe they, they pre-ordered something, and so Lowe's owes customers, and this is in millions, and so, you know, $1,253,000,000 in deferred revenue. So that's a lot of deferred revenue. Let's look at accrued expenses. Okay, so what are we talking about here? In this type situation, we need to look for items that are not recorded on the books yet. And so our last payday was December 28th, and we saw that entry in the previous chapter, but you know the end of the year doesn't happen until three days later. And so the em employees have earned another $300 by working for us from December 28th to the 31st since they've worked for us, but the next payday isn't until January 4th. We don't pay them in December 31st. We wait until the next payday, you know, a week later. They've worked for us. What they've earned, we're gonna record that as an expense as of the end of the year. We owe them that money and we will pay them that money on January 4th. So the $700 per week they're earning Three days have gone by, three, you know, $300 we owe them. We'll pay them this $300 and the $400 they're going to earn next year on January 4th for $700. But as of the end of the year, we have an expense that has happened, another $300 in the salary expense account, and we owe them the $300 at the end of the year because we've not paid them. So here's the entry. Debit salary expense, increasing expenses $300. Credit salaries payable. This is a new liability account. Call it exactly what it is. Salaries payable, $300. So debit salaries expense, credit salaries payable. So what we're doing here is recording exactly what has happened. Some days have gone by from the last payday to the end of the accounting period. Our employees have earned $300. We're not going to pay them yet, but we do owe them the money. And we're going to pay them the next payday. So we're recording exactly what has happened. More expense we've had, we owe some more money, in this case to our employees. Another example would be utility cost. 
We've not recorded this yet, but let's say on December 31st, we receive our utility bill and we have $900 we've used for the month. We just got the bill at the end of the year. We've used this and you know when you receive your utility bill, you have, you know, like a week or so before you have to pay it. Same thing here. But at the end of the year, let's record exactly where things stand. We've used utilities. We need to show this as an expense. We need to show the fact we owe them the money at the end of the year. Here's the adjusting entry. Debit with you know, increasing utilities expense, $900. And crediting utilities payable, $900. Record the expense. Record the payable. Because we are recording exactly what has happened. We've used the, facility, the utilities for this month. It's an expense for this month. We owe the money at the end of the year. And we're going to pay them the money on January 6th. But as of the end of the year, we still owe the money. We've not written a check yet to pay for the utilities. Accrued interest. We borrowed $10,000, if you remember, on December 1st. The interest rate is 12,000, excuse me, 12%, not 12,000, 12%. That's for an entire year. That's an annual interest rate or the equivalent of, you know, 1% per month. Well, whenever you see the, the interest rate given to you, it's always the annual rate. And then you can convert that into a monthly rate if you want to, but you don't have to. Uh, we're going to see how to do that with a fraction in just a minute, but 12%. Now we don't have to pay this interest until next December 1st into the next year. But since we've used the money this year, we've used the $10,000 for our operations. Interest is starting to build up. We need to record one month of interest expense for December. How do we calculate this? It's always the principal $10,000 times the interest rate, annual rate 12% times what I always call the time period. We're looking at one month. So this is one month over 12 months. This 12 here is not the same 12 here. If this had been 8%, this would still be one over 12. Okay, so this is one month over 12 months because this is an annual rate. So $10,000, the principal of the loan, times 12% per year, times only one month over 12 months, $100 is the interest for one month. We have not recorded yet this yet. So we need to record this as an adjusting entry. Again, you're recording exactly what has happened. We've used the $10,000 for one month. That means we owe interest for one month that we will eventually pay it next year. But $100 at the end of this year, we owe this money. Here's the entry. A new expense, interest expense, and a new payable, interest payable. So we've used the money we have one month of expense that has been incurred. We're going to record the expense and we owe that money that we're going to pay later. We're going to pay it next December 1st. But as of this December 31st, we owe a hundred dollars and we will eventually pay that. Okay. Now this is showing you on the flip side, like the bank, what would they record? They would record on December 31st, interest receivable because we owe them the money and they would record interest revenue. Don't worry about this. I don't want to confuse things. This is the most important entry for us. We borrowed the money. We record the interest expense. We owe the money. And so interest payable. Now account receivable. Regardless of the other transactions we've had about earning money and so forth and customers and clients, here we have uh, new revenue being earned. Now from December 28th to the 31st, we provided more services to customers and they have not paid this yet. And we have not recorded this yet. We've not sent them the invoice. But if we have several more days since the last, you know, entry we've made to record revenue and we provided more services to people, and they owe us the money, we need to make an adjusted entry for that. We've done the work. They owe us the money. Let's record that exact fact at the end of the year. Now they'll pay us the money later on, but now they owe us the money. The entry would be debit account receivable, increasing this asset account $700 and increasing service revenue 700. So again, 
We earn this money. This is unrelated to any of the transactions we had for revenue in the past. We've earned this money. They owe us the money. They owe it to us, receivables. We've earned it, revenue. How would you know this? Well, you just look at your own records. You know, you look, you know, you keep up, you know, who you've done work for, if they paid you or not, and so forth, have you made an entry yet or not. And so if you provided services and you've not collected the cash, and as of the end of the year, you've not made an entry for this, you need to make an adjusting entry. And again, this records exactly what has happened. We've done the work, revenue, they owe us the money, receivable. And there's a review. So that's a review of all the adjusting entries. You know, you can look at this example if you want to. Um, a little bit detailed, so you might want to go back and you know review this part of the video again uh, to have a more complete understanding of adjusting entries. Next section. Here is a uh, summary of all the adjusting entries we just went through. So adjusting entries A through what do we have down here H. So several adjusting entries. Now. What we'll do accounting wise then, after we make these journal entries, we'll post these numbers, these entries into the ledger accounts. So what you'll do is go to entry A, where we increased rent expense 500 and decreased prepaid rent 500. Entry A, adjusting entry A, come down to the ledger accounts, look for rent expense, here's the A, increase 500. The other part of that, prepaid rent, Here's the A credit, decrease 500. So it's 6,000 minus 500, we're down to 5,500, which again means that we prepaid the rent as of January 1st, we prepaid another 11 months, so $5,500 should be in this account at the very end of December, which carries over to January 1st, so this account is now accurate. And you would do this for every one of these entries. I'm not gonna take the time to go through every one of these, but go to entry B, Supplies expense, debit, supplies credit, supplies expense, here we go, B, 1,000, increase. Supplies, the asset account, decrease 1,000, so 23 minus 1,000, 1,300. So I'll let you follow all these changes through, and as you bring those adjusting entries into these accounts, bring the balances up to date. Wherever you have an adjusting entry, bring those up to date. Now what we can do is prepare what's called an adjusted trial balance. So after these adjusting entries, after you post them and bring the accounts up to date, we prepare an adjusted trial balance. The reason is, is just to check and make sure before we prepare the financial statements, do the debits equal the credits? Go down to the bottom, and yes, they do. So these are all the accounts we've adjusted. Uh, some we did not adjust. We did not adjust the cash account, did not adjust the equipment account, uh, did not adjust um, notes payable or common stock, but a lot of the other accounts we did adjust. So this is, again, just a check at this point. Uh, hopefully everything is correct because the debits equal the credits. Next section. Now we can prepare the financial statements. We have the adjusted trial balance at this point. And here it is. Uh, hopefully you can read this okay in the video. This is what we just saw a minute ago. We're gonna use the numbers in the adjusted trial balance. Now that the accounts are all brought up to date, to prepare an accurate set of financial statements. So you remember the first statement we prepare is the income statement. So these are the income statement accounts in the adjusted trial balance make a habit of preparing the adjusted trial balance in this order. Your assets, liabilities, equity, and then your, your income statement accounts. So look at this bottom section, your revenue, all your expenses, they all go into here. Revenues, expenses, total expenses, net income 1200. Now we need this 1200 to now go into the statement of stockholders equity. And since, if you remember, this is the very first month of operations, and we started the month with a zero in the common stock account, and then we sold stock to the stockholders, we show that change for December. 
Issuance common stock during this month, 25. New balance, 25. Retain earnings, start of the zero. We add net income. And remember, we pay dividends of 200. Here's the dividend account, 200. Goes in here. It reduces retained earnings. So our retained earnings has an ending balance of $1,000. We need that number to go into the stockholders' equity section. In fact, the 25,000 and the 1,000 drop in here. All of these other accounts, assets, and liabilities come straight from the uh, adjusted trial balance. So they all come over here. These two numbers drop in, and then we have the balance sheet, which looks good. It balances $40,000. So use the numbers in the up-to-date adjusted trial balance to, first of all, prepare the income statement, then the stockholders' equity statement, then the balance sheet. And in these pages of the book, it just shows you in larger format the income statement. Nothing is new here. Here's the equity statement. And here's the balance sheet. Now, if you notice in the balance sheet, not only do we have assets and liabilities, but we have sub-accounts sub now. Current assets and long-term assets. Current liabilities, long-term liabilities. So in the current assets section, you will show items that are either cash or will be converted to cash or will be used up within the next coming year. And so cash, always list it first. Receivables next. These are pretty close. Uh, you don't have to have a, like an exact order for like supplies and rent, but always show your cash first. It's the most current account, the most liquid account, I should say. So cash, receivables, and start listing some of the other current assets. Show your total current assets, then go to your long-term assets. Here we have equipment. This is where you would have like buildings, um, uh, land, and so forth. Then you would take away any accumulated appreciation you have, and sometimes you see a subtotal here, like net long-term assets. They don't happen to show it here, but I, I like to see it. But your total assets, $40,000. Liabilities, current assets are, are, excuse me, current liabilities are liabilities that will be paid within the next year or recorded as revenue in the next year. List those. Always list accounts payable first. These others really don't make a difference. Always accounts payable first. Get the total, total current liabilities. Long-term liabilities, notes payable, only one. I think this is what, a, a three-year note, I believe, so long-term. Show total liabilities. Then stockholders' equity, and there's the up-to-date comma stock account and retained earnings, total stockholders' equity, and now add total liabilities plus stockholders' equity to get total liabilities stockholders' equity, which equals the assets. Everything balances. And, I, and this is explaining what I just uh, talked about. Um, let me see. Don't worry about the statement of cash flows in this chapter. Now, the closing process, let's just touch on this. Um, you might have one mobile choice question about this. I'm not going to have you do the entries and so forth. But this is what the accountants do at the, at the in, very end of the accounting cycle after you prepare the statements we just went through. And what you will do, what this does, is bring to zero your revenue account, your expense accounts, and your dividend account. You bring all those to zero by what they say, closing those into the retained earnings account. Now, why do you want to bring the revenue and expense accounts, and dividends account to zero? You want to get the books ready to start January 1st off with no, nothing in those accounts. So when you start a new accounting period off, you want nothing. You want zero in those accounts and then start showing revenue earned for that new year. Show expenses incurred for that new year. So that's what you do. I'm not gonna have you prepare a closing entries on an exam or anything. This is a quick glance. And then what happens, um, let's see, next section, they can show it to us. Yeah, post-closing trial balance. You post those closing entries. You can see them in the, uh, the red here or I guess the blue are the closing entries, the blue. And then this is the post-closing trial balance. You only have assets, liabilities, and equity. Your post-closing trial balance does not have anything in your revenues, 
accounts, expense accounts, or your dividend accounts. Those are all zero, so you don't have to show them. But again, don't worry about your closing entries very much at all. Chapter highlights. This is a good page for you to review. Okay, It tells you about the entries you make when you first pay for something, like for rent in advance, and then the related just adjusting entry. Receive cash in advance. You're going to you know, perform the services later. Here's the related adjusting entry. So review this closely. Um, then they show you know the statements again. Just a short section there. And then the end of the material, uh, end of the chapter. Let's see. Glossary, good look at that. Go through these self-study questions. Uh, see if you can answer it. And then if you, you know, uh, they're looking for dates here. Click on the answer. You know, there's the answer. So hopefully you can get those. So uh, take a look at those. Well, that's the end of chapter three. Sort of a long uh, chapter. Very detailed explanation. But the whole thing about this chapter is to understand that at the end of the accounting period, the accounts need to make sure each account is up to date. If it's need, it needs to be adjusted, they are adjusted, those accounts are adjusted, and then once you have all the accounts adjusted, prepare the adjusted trial balance. That makes you, you know, sure the debits equal the credits. Then prepare the financial statements, and then those should be very accurate financial statements at that point. That's the main purpose of this chapter. So good luck with your studies.